We are in week three of our series called Grow, First Steps with Jesus. And today is all about the lifestyle of a Christian. What does it mean to live a Jesus-following lifestyle? Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to share with you something that you probably might not know about me. And um, to be honest, it is, well, it's quite embarrassing. So <clears throat> here it goes. I almost flunked my first term in grade eight. So there it is. It's out there. I almost didn't make grade eight. And you're probably thinking why. And no, it's not as you were thinking. It's not because of my intelligence levels. No, the main contribution factor of me having an absolutely horrible, terrible year, my first year of high school, had to do with the kind of friends that I was surrounded with. It was these guys that was a bad influence on me and ultimately led me to the point where I would be in this very low space of basically almost not making my first year in high school. Terrible. However, on the flip side of the story is that grade 9, that's standard 7 for, for the older folk, grade 9 was my turnaround here. And yes, you guessed it right. The reason why it was such a big turnaround for me had to do with my friends. Um, my friends have changed um, from grade 8 to grade 9, and, and a little bit more particularly, one specific friend in my life, his name is Brom. Now, Brom wasn't the most popular guy in school. He wasn't the guy everybody wanted to be with. But Brom was the guy that, ex that like opened up an opportunity, extended a hand of friendship to me. I'll never forget this man. He would actually ultimately end up being uh, the best man at my wedding day and is still till today a good friend of mine. But what Brom did in grade nine for me changed my life in a radical way. In fact, you can say the trajectory of my life in grade eight was all the way down. I'm going to become a bum sitting on the street. Um, but if it wasn't for Brahm's love, his friendship that he extended, and in fact, this friendship would start changing my life radically. I remember one break time, we went out, and usually during break, we'd go sit together and just have a nice chat and have a nice time together. Now, you need to understand, up until this moment, grade eight, still living quite an interesting life. Grade nine, I had this kind of little habit going on at school. I would go to school every single day, and then my main focus would be to connect with the right people that already finished their homework, borrowing books, and then I would just sit and copy homework as far as I go. Whenever I get an open opportunity, I would copy homework. So it was this one break time that Brahm looked at me and um, with a very loving and stern question asked me, Lorraine, is this really the kind of life that you'd like to live? And that was while I was busy opening up a book, busy copying. He says, do you really want to be known for stealing other people's work? Is that the kind of life you want to live? Now you can guess for yourself that from that moment on, everything changed radically. That day, right there, and then I decided never, ever again, because of this friend who extended love towards me, asking me. And, and conversations like this with Brahm has led to the point where my lifestyle changed radically from where I was a guy stealing people's work to becoming a guy doing his own homework. Now, when we talk about the Christian lifestyle, it's actually kind of exactly the same thing. A Christian's behavior, his lifestyle, is formed by the relationship that he has with Jesus. Just like that relationship that I had and still have till today with one of my good friends, Brahm. You know, there's this idea out there, and so many people believe this, that we need to change our behaviors in order for Jesus to love us. I don't know if you're one of those people or if you've grown up in that space, but can I just make one big statement? That that's probably the biggest lie you'll ever hear. 
The Bible tells us that God loved us while we were still sinners, while we were the baddest of the bad. He extended his hand of friendship, just like Brahm did, while I was in that bad space. Like, I can't think anybody wanted to be my friend. Brahm extended his hand of loving friendship to me. And in the same way, Jesus did it to you and me. And in fact, this idea of we need to change our behavior for God to love us, I've talked to people about this. I don't know if you've heard this, but people would tell me, you know what, I'll, I invite them to church. And they'll say, well, I'll come to church when I, I just first need to figure out some stuff in my life. I'll need to get some stuff ready before. That's people that believe I need to change my behavior for Jesus to love me, to be acceptable to Jesus. And that's simply just not the truth. However, the opposite is. It's the fact that Jesus loves me that my behavior starts changing, that my lifestyle starts changing, just like my friendship with Brahm changed me. I love the way Paul says it, Colossians 2, verses 6 to 7. He goes on and writes the following. He says, So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, how did that happen? Talked about it last week. It happened through the grace of God. Through his love. Nothing that you and I did could get us saved. Could get us to the point where Jesus would again be the Lord of my life. And I'm not running the show by myself. It's only Jesus' love that changed me. Now Paul says, just like that grace, he wants us to continue to walk in him. Being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. Just as you were taught an overflow with gratitude. Paul likens our relationship with Jesus as a journey of walking with him. Now, just quickly two things about walking. The first thing is that walking is not standing. I don't know if you've noted that, but standing is kind of a very passive activity. And in the same way, Paul is telling us that our relationship with Jesus is not a passive one. No, it's an active one. It's a partnership. It's, it's working together. It's two people, two persons in an active relationship. It's walking with Jesus. But the second thing about walking is that walking is also not running. Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever been in a relationship where either you or the person in this relationship wants to outrun the natural growth of that relationship. I mean, they want to force you, this relationship is being forced into a place where it's not yet ready to go. I mean, I think of many romantic relationships that goes that way. They're not really ready yet for the next stage of this relationship, but we're pushing it to go to a place where it's not yet ready to go. We're outrunning this relationship. I've been in some of those, and can I tell you something? They seem to end even quicker than they started. It's, it's the best way, it's the greatest guarantee for you to be fake in a relationship, is to try and outrun it, try to go with it where it's not yet ready to go. So walking with Jesus is not outrunning Jesus. And there are people trying to do this. That's where we many times get religion, like trying to force God's hand, trying to outrun this rhythms of grace, the unforced rhythms of grace that we get to walk a road with Jesus in. However, Paul asks us and invites us to walk with God. And walking is very interesting. Walking is this mundane, every single day activity. That's actually kind of the picture. If you think about walking, it's just one foot in front of the other. One foot in front of the other. That's the picture of walking. It's so much a part of who I am. I don't even think about it when I'm walking it's kind of like breathing. It just happens. And he says, that's the relationship that you get to have with Jesus. It's an everyday thing. It's not an, a sprint moment. It's not a passive one. It's not overactive. It's just so much a part of me. And I'm taking one step in front of the other. That is the invitation for you and for me. So, how does it look and how do I know my lifestyle 
is being formed by a relationship with Jesus and not by a relationship with this world or with religion. How will I know that the lifestyle that I'm living is being formed by this relationship that I have with Jesus? Well, I believe there are four things, four things that I'd like to quickly point out to you that maybe might be a signpost to kind of see whether I'm living from a relationship with Jesus or a relationship with the world or religion. So the first way that you'll probably know your lifestyle, your behavior is formed by this relationship is in the way you read your Bible. Because reading Bible, when you have a relationship with Jesus, changes from being mere inspiration to becoming a revelation. So, you know, people out there think the Bible is this grab bag of inspirational verses. It's kind of like I'm finding my verse for the day and I feel better, like everything is possible with Jesus kind of picture, and now I feel good again, you know? And um, the picture of the Bible is, and the reality is, is that it's not at all this. The Bible shouldn't be treated as fables from Aesop's fables book. It's not what's the moral of the story. No. The Bible speaks for itself. In fact, Jesus tells us what the Bible is and what it speaks of. There's this story in Luke 24, chapter 24, where Jesus meets two travelers on the road to Emmaus. It happened right after the resurrection. And he finds two guys, two disciples, I believe, of him, was following Jesus, very disappointed with the events that happened in Jerusalem, talking about the crucifixion, and in a sense just, I'm not happy with the fact, and I'm very disappointed with the fact that the guy, Jesus Christ, this great prophet that I thought would be the Messiah, the one that I thought would change things for us, well, he's dead now. What are we going to do about it? And then Jesus, in a moment, I want to say, it feels like when I'm reading it, like he's a little bit frustrated with these guys. He tells them, how foolish are you guys? How slow are you to believe? Don't you know what all the prophets spoke about? Did you not see? Don't you see that the Messiah had to suffer these things to enter into his glory? Kind of like, guys, don't you see what the scripture is all about? And then he goes into verse 27 and he makes this statement. He says, and beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, that's just a way of saying the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, and then the rest of the Old Testament. So he started taking the Old Testament. So he began with that. And he starts to explain to them what was said in the scriptures concerning him. You know how powerful this is? I wanted to be part of that journey. I would really have loved to be on that road, walking with Jesus, just listening to that amazing Bible study moment. Because the reality is, is Jesus is saying to us that the Bible is the revelation of God. Through Jesus Christ. It's the person of Jesus that's revealed to us so that the world can get to know God. Have you ever wondered who God is? What he thinks about? What his purpose is? What's his idea for this world and for you? Well, the Bible is the place where it's been revealed through Jesus. And everything in the Bible points and culminates in this one person called Jesus. It's one unified story pointing to Jesus. And let me tell you, if you live in a relationship with Jesus and you start reading the Bible, you start discovering the person of Jesus on every single page of your Bible, I promise you, you won't be able to put it down. It becomes an amazing journey with this person. That's the place where you get to know him. Almost like I would sit down and spend some time listening to stories of my friends in their past. And I get to know who they are. That's the same invitation. Bible changes from inspiration to revelation. Second thing is your prayer life. Your prayer life would probably change from being a monologue into becoming a dialogue. I don't know if you know this, but prayer is a conversation. And the conversation, just by the way, is not one person. It's not a vlog. It's not me sitting over YouTube and having a one-way conversation and information. It's actually a conversation between two people, exchanging thoughts and ideas, listening to one another, sharing what's on their heart. 
That is prayer. And when you are in a relationship, lifestyle is formed by a relationship with Jesus. Life turns into probably the most powerful dialogue you could ever enter into. You're going to speak to the Creator. Now, I've speak, spoken to so many people. Actually, a few days ago, I spoke to a guy that was struggling with this idea of having Bible study. There's just a lot of death in that moment. It just feels like nothing is happening. And when I'm praying, it's like the ceiling and everything just going up against this ceiling right here. And I started talking to him. I said, well, do you ever give time just to listen? after you've prayed, after you've spoken, that God can speak back. You know what his response was? He said, well, I'm afraid. I'm too afraid. I'm afraid of the silences. What if God doesn't speak back to me? I don't know. I don't know, I don't know if he wants to. Can I quickly share a verse with you? 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says the following. Pray constantly. Other translation says, pray without ceasing. Do you know what that means? <laughs> this is amazing. It means God wants you and me to have a conversation with him. He invites us to every single moment of the day, in fact. As much as possible, speak to him. But not only does God invite you to speak to him, he wants to speak to you. Wow. Can you imagine that? The creator of the universe wants to share what's on his heart. He wants to. He's inviting you to come and listen. In fact, he sent his son down, the word of God, coming down from heaven to earth so that you might hear what's on his heart for you. You don't need to be afraid. Trusting, living from a relationship with Jesus, living the lifestyle of a Christian means you enter into a dialogue with the Creator. The third thing that probably changes when you live a Christian lifestyle, when it's formed from a relationship with Jesus, is the fact that you stop attending church and you start being the church. I love the way Paul puts it, Ephesians 4 verse 16. He says, from him the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building itself up in love. Then he says, how does this work? How do you build the body up in love? By the proper working of each individual part. Now in this little text, very famous portion, Paul likens the church to being the body of Christ. And you know what I find interesting about every single body on this planet is that every person with their body has a responsibility towards themselves and towards those around him or her, to their neighbor. And if I don't look well after myself, meaning I don't brush my teeth and I don't wash up a little bit, the people around me are going to find it quite interesting spending some time with me. And it's the same with this. Paul says, if you want to be the church and stop attending church, it means you have responsibility towards yourself, towards the church, and also the church having a responsibility towards the world. There is something that we need to bring. And when it comes to our responsibility towards self, he says, church is not just about attending, but it's about building. It's about building up the body. And the way we do this is by finding our proper space of working in this body. To be a part of the church, guys, means we are active, not passive. In fact, it means to be actively building into one another, into your brother and your sister. So that's the first part of the body. The second part is that we have a responsibility towards the world out there, to others. And as we build up the church, we are called to build out God's kingdom. Jesus put it like this. He says, your kingdom come and your will be done. In fact, that's the picture. That's the calling. That's the exciting part of being the church is that we go out there and we take God's kingdom into this world. And wherever God's kingdom is, is where his will is done. That's where the king reigns, where his will 
is done. And He's calling you and He's calling me to take out His will into our workplace, with our friends, all over this world. You and I are not just called to build up His church, but also to build out His kingdom. And when you live in a relationship with Jesus, your life is given to those things. That's what naturally happens. Then lastly, and I think this is so crucial, when you live in a relationship with Jesus, you stop running from God and you start running to God. I'll never forget this. As a young Christian, whenever I did something wrong, the last place that I wanted to go was to God. In fact, I would go home at night and I would actually go and pray and ask Jesus, please do not come tonight. If you're going to come tonight, I'm going to be in big trouble. It's over. It's tickets with me. That's literally where I was at that stage. But you see, it was as I was growing and maturing and discovering that God's love for me is unconditional, not based on what I've done, and the fact that I am now a child of God. Just by the way, when you're a child of God, how can you ever undo that? If you're a child of anyone, I mean your parents, you cannot undo being their daughter or their son. It's your birthright. It's a reality because of something far greater than you that brought you into existence. So in the same way, as you live in a relationship with Jesus, the Father becomes your place of safety. A place where you can run to when you're in trouble. Not someone that you run from. He loves you. In fact, Jesus removed every single barrier thinkable, even sin, so that you and I can have a relationship with Him. Let's pray. Father, as we look at this wonderful new life that we get to live and how it is formed, by a relationship with you. I want to come and pray in the name of Jesus and ask that your Holy Spirit would guide our hearts to never want to try behavior modification because that's not the invitation. No. But to give ourselves fully to this relationship that we get to have because of a big price that you have in Jesus' name I pray that the trees in Dr. Dale, meaning each and every single person that's planted in Jesus, would grow, would grow from this truth. That Jesus loves you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.